You could say the Mustang Mach 1 is a classic muscle car, but that's not really giving it a fair shake. And speaking of shake, there's no shaker hood for this 2021 revival. You see, the days when Detroit made cars that only went in a straight line are long gone. But this still has the first commandment from the Detroit Bible of fast cars. Thou shalt have a front engine, rear drive, V8, and a manual transmission. It's a decades-old formula and a deep part of American car culture. But today, things are a little bit different, and the Mach 1 does sit pretty high up on the totem pole, but the world has evolved a little bit, and now there might be some dark clouds on the horizon. The quicker way to get to that horizon is with a 5-liter V8. Now, the Mach 1, it only has the Coyote engine, so why is it so expensive, and what is this thing like to live with on a day-to-day -day basis? We're gonna find out. The regular Mustang GT Premium, that starts at about $40,000. This Mach 1 starts at about $53,000, but this one is configured up to almost 68. And then you've got the Mustang GT 500. Now that is about $100,000 with options, maybe more. So this sits in the middle between the GT and the GT 500. The Mach 1 is a very track-focused vehicle. You get the performance package, and then you've also got the MagnaRide suspension. It's the most recent one. It's an adaptive suspension setup. In the front, you've got 19.9.5 inch tires, 10 inch in the rear, and the brakes, these are six piston Brembos with 15 inch rotors. So you've got the Coyote engine, which in this configuration is 480 horsepower. So it makes 20 more horsepower than the regular GT. And then taken from the GT350, we've got the intake manifold and the throttle body. Now, most importantly, this gets a six-speed manual transmission, but not the Getrag from the normal GT. This gets a Tremec 3160, which comes out of the GT350. Now this has auto rev matching and no lift shifting, so when you're at the drag strip, you don't even need to take your foot off the gas. Now this transmission should have enhanced durability, but you can also get the 10-speed automatic transmission. Not my personal choice, it's very good, but if you're gonna go road racing, guys, just get the manual. Just get the manual, it's really good. So this has the $3,500 handling package, and with that, you get these incredible looking wheels. They're actually two pounds lighter than the regular wheels, and they're one inch wider. You get 11 in the back, 10.5 in the front, and they are wrapped with Michelin Sport Cup 2 tires. Super sticky. You get the rear spoiler with a gurney flap. The chassis tuning is different. You've also got this really cool extra lower splitter. It is quite low. Like every car that has some mods to go to the track, this air dam, while functional on a day-to-day -day basis, is pretty low and it tends to scrape the ground, especially when you're coming out of driveways or you're going over speed bumps even. What makes this a track car is that it comes with adjustable top mounts on the struts. So the under tray extends 20 inches farther back for additional airflow, smooth things out, and the belly pan has some special cooling wraps to cool the brakes a little bit better, and the list just goes on and on and on. Now the GT350 and 350R had the amazing 5.2 liter flat plane crank engine revved out to 8,250 RPM. They're gone, so let's pour one out for the Voodoo engine. Let's also pour one out for the GT350 and 350R. They're gone. Rip. <laughs> now, if you think those are some dark clouds, we've also got some more dark clouds on the horizon, especially for this car. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. So we're here in the canyons today to explore what the Mach 1 drives like. And we gotta start off with this engine. This, of course, is the Coyote engine. I gotta say, I really, really like this engine. I know it's been around for a long time. In this particular trim, it makes 480 horsepower. 420 pound-feet of torque 
and it's a honey. It really does like to rev, it revs out all the way to 7,500 RPM, and it makes a maximum power at 7,000, and it just sounds really, really good. The front end of this is unique to the Mach 1. You've got this two-piece upper grill here, um, and then you've got these blackout, they look like, I guess these would have been fog lamps or something like that. They look like air induction pieces, but they are blacked out. You've got a lot of airflow up here. You've got airflow here, going into the radiator and down here. Below the turn signals, you have this grill opening here, which is also unique to this car. The headlights, this cluster here, part of it is from the GT500. And then you've got this molding around the wheel wells as well. One of the big differences between this car and the regular Mustang GT is this Tremec transmission. The shifter is so good. It's definitely one of the best I've used in a long time. It's very precise. It's got a real solid indent. It's really satisfying to shift. It's supposed to be more durable too than the other transmission that they have in the regular GT. The differential out back is cooled and pedal placement, the pedal box, is very good. Ford did a great job with this car. It is very easy to heel and toe this car when you want to. The placement is perfect. It does roll my foot over, blip the throttle a little bit, and you can just get down to the next gear. Just like that. Very, very satisfying. Everything feels really harmonious uh, with the shifter here. So this is big, big, big improvement over the regular GT. This color is unique. It's called Jet Fighter Gray, and this is part of the appearance package, which includes these stripes, this interesting look on the hood. The interior is pretty much typical Mustang. So you got a combination of things in here. You got some nice materials. You got this kind of cool brushed aluminum dash, but then you get like something like the turn signal that is maybe not that big a deal, but it doesn't feel that positive. How much would it take to make this feel just a little bit more of a solid click? It's just not that satisfying. Behind the steering wheel, you've got these little stitching pieces that kind of extend into the wheel. Again, it's not a big thing, but it's a small thing that just reminds you that they could have spent a few more dollars on it. So there's plenty of hard plastics in here. You do have some nice materials, but the argument for the Mustang has always been that you're not paying for the interior, you're paying for the performance. But there's a problem with that. Ford makes the Mach-E in the interior, and that is almost Lexus-like. Maybe it's a little bit better than a Toyota. It's definitely a big step up from this. And if you've seen the Lincoln products, they can make some really nice interiors too. So I'm still having a hard time with spending all this money on the performance, which I really appreciate. And you still get an interior that is kind of a little bit chintzy. So we've got some different drive modes in this car. There's actually quite a few, it's very configurable. So you've got the normal mode, then you've got Sport Plus or Sport. You've got mud and snow. You've even got a drag strip mode, and then you've got track mode. And with these different modes, you've got different levels of adjustability with the suspension. So this has got the most recent version of the Magna Ride suspension. So these are active dampers, and they can dynamically adjust to the road conditions many, many times per second. And what Magna Ride is, it's magnetic. Basically, you've got little tiny particles in the fluid, little um, probably little iron particles, and then when you add a charge to them, the, the viscosity of the fluid in the shocks can get stiffer or can get thinner, just, just like that. And this works really, really well in this car. The suspension is definitely a high point. Now, it's a pretty stiff car to drive, I'm not gonna lie, but it's not punishing. This is something that you can drive every single day. Right now, I've got it in normal mode, we're on a pretty bumpy back road here. I feel like I don't really need anything more than normal on this road, and it soaks up the bumps very, very effectively. Now, when you put it into, let's say, sport mode, a couple things happen. Now, so the dashboard changes, and it lets me know it's ready for performance, it's ready for action. The tack goes across the dash, and now you hear the engine. 
engine's a lot louder, so you've got different modes for the exhaust too, and it's all configurable any way that you want to do it. There's something called my mode, you can adjust the suspension damping, you can adjust launch control, and also the steering. So this is a track focused vehicle, of course, and if you're gonna to go to the drag strip, you probably do wanna get the automatic transmission, but this does have drag strip mode in it, so let's see how effective launch control is with this manual transmission. Definitely more fun with the traction control off. <laughs> Now this vehicle has the optional Recaro seats. They're in leather, they have a lot of bolstering. They're very comfortable, but more importantly, they're very grippy when you're going around corners. Now these are manual adjust, but if you're gonna get a car like this, come on, get the manual and get the seats too. There's different levels of steering in here that I can get by flipping a switch. And in my opinion, this is an electric steering system, EPAS4 calls it. It's really good. There's a lot of feel in the steering system compared with some other manufacturers. Like I don't like what BMW has been doing with their steering systems. This is much better because it's actually a smaller motor in here than something like the BMW uses, which is a real high torque motor. So this gives less assist and it actually gives a lot more feedback through the steering wheel. And in a car like this, when you're at the track or on a road like this, you really want to feel what the front of the car is doing and I'm getting a lot of feedback. It's very, very communicative. People in these videos always do the back seat test to see how much headroom there is. Let's check it out. So here, Ford has done a big improvement by removing the back seat. I've still got, actually I don't really have much headroom here. This is an option to do the rear seat delete. It's supposed to bring the weight down. This is still a pretty heavy car though. <laughs> I wonder how much weight they're saving with the rear seat delete. Ugh. Now this has massive, massive Pilot Sport Cup two tires on here. They're 305 in the front, 315 in the rear, and they provide way more grip than you're ever really going to use going through a canyon like this. They are very, very effective. They have so much, so much grip, sort of endless levels of grip here. It's gonna be pretty difficult to get into a lot of trouble with these tires. In fact, they're so grippy that uh, if you're coming out of a corner, even in second gear with traction control off, you're not gonna get a lot of wheel spin. One thing about this platform that Ford has done a really good job, and especially in the GT500, is the way it puts power down coming out of corners. It's very effective. There's no drama, you've got no wheel spin, and the fact that this engine it's of course naturally aspirated. It's very progressive. It doesn't make a lot of torque. It really likes to rev. It's very easy to handle and balance on corner exit. So the switch gear for the HVAC system and the different performance modes, these feel really nice, but they kind of look a little bit cheap. Everything is just starting to feel a little bit dated in this interior. So let's talk about a couple of the downsides of this vehicle. So in my opinion, one of them is weight. This is a fairly hefty car. With the manual transmission, it weighs almost 3,900 pounds. And with the automatic, the 10 speed, you're getting up around 3,913, I think. So it's a pretty heavy car and you can definitely feel it. Now I just came back from the GR86 launch event. We're dealing with cars there that weigh 2,800 pounds. It's a full 1,100 pounds difference, and I know it's not the same class of car, but dynamically, a lighter car is just better in my opinion. And so this is, you know, this is kind of a brute. This is not a ballerina in the corners. This is more of a bulldog. You kind of, it kind of like muscles its way through just with raw mechanical grip. And it's not like it's a bad thing. It is just different than driving a lightweight car. The other big downside is if you're going to the track with a car like this, it's gonna be expensive because more weight, more power means you're gonna go through brakes, you're gonna go through tires, you're gonna go through gas, consumables. It's gonna be kind of an expensive car to track. Maybe you're not getting the interior here.
here, you are getting the performance, but the performance is great. The Ford engineers have really put together a cohesive package. They've been at this for a long time with the Mustang, and it all kind of comes together here. But not everything about the Mach 1 is sunshine and roses. It does have one very significant flaw, a potential death blow. The fatal flaw is not something designed on a computer or made in a factory. The fatal flaw is the internal combustion engine itself. The world is moving pretty quickly to hybrids and electrics, perhaps a little bit more quickly than we thought. But you know, I still like to go to the track and I work in my own cars, so I've been using Lexavon tools. I think they're pretty good for the money, they're pretty high quality. I've got a link in the description down below. I've also got some videos on how to use a torque wrench if that's useful to you. The Mustang Mach-E, fully electric. The Ford F-150 Lightning, fully electric. The Maverick, it's a hybrid. There's even a hybrid F-150, so Ford is leaning pretty heavily on hybrids for the next couple of years. Ford is investing something like $29 billion into electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and infrastructure such as manufacturing, and even building out the cloud so they can roll out updates over the air. VW and other OEMs have invested heavily in the EVs as well. Ford says they plan to have 40% of their sales EVs by 2030. And in the EU, they are voting on a bill right now which would eliminate the sale of internal combustion engines completely by 2035. And this is not just some passing trend. This is a sea change affecting the entire industry globally. So the Mach 1 is possibly the last of its generation. I've had this vehicle for a week and I absolutely love this vehicle. It's extremely well engineered. It's very easy to live with on a daily basis. It is a lot of fun in the canyons. It's extremely well balanced. The brakes are good. The Tremec transmission is really fantastic. It's definitely a throwback. There's a lot I like about this car. The suspension is firm, but it definitely won't beat you up. It's very livable on a day-to-day -day basis. The Coyote engine is fantastic. It's so engaging. It wants to make you row through the gears up and down just to hear it. And the active exhaust makes it just a little bit better. And thankfully they have a quiet mode so you can start it up in the morning and not piss off your neighbors. At $68,000, it is pretty expensive. So it's a little bit of a hard bargain Ford is driving, but you do get a lot more than the regular Mustang GT. If you're like me and you value a V8 manual, you should go and pick one of these up because who knows how much longer they're going to be around. My name is Eric. Thanks for watching.